As some of the young folk are going to come this morning. Way to go, girls. Way to go. You know, there's a lot of people in the church that are sick. I know the pastor's not feeling well. A lot of us have been under the weather, but God is, is He is so good. It's a joy to be in church today. I like this song that we're going to sing. I hope it's a blessing to you.
wonderful song called Holy Spirit, Thou Art Welcome. And oh, we invite the Holy Spirit to come and breathe upon us today. Yes. Touch the choir as they sing. Touch every pew, every person in this room. Touch this pastor, Holy Spirit. Give him grace. Give him strength as he preaches. <clears throat> but uh, we just want to sing that to you this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. is salvation. There is a river. <clears throat>
Oh, tap into that river. And that grace and mercy and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ is available today. This song is one that uh, we changed at the last minute to sing. We're going to sing, I am blessed. So many people are touched and blessed by this song. And sometimes you just get so full of the blessings of God, you got to let it out. Uh, Pastor talks about these spells. Are you, it's, I think it's really good, Pastor, every once in a while to have a spell. Just celebrate how the Lord has blessed you. Listen to this song. I am blessed. Ms. Yvonne, are you blessed? Yes. Are you blessed, Yvonne? Yes. Actually, Amen. That's her favorite song. I am blessed. so blessed. I mean, sometimes it just needs to pop out of us. 438. Brother Charles enjoys this song and I understand why. It's called Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. 438, if you would turn to it, we're going to sing all the verses. Three verses and we'll come back and sing the chorus last. Stand with us, please. 438. Heaven came down.
Maybe Katie at the last minute tells somebody you love them this morning. Good morning and welcome to Oakland Avenue Baptist Church, especially those that are visiting with us today. If you're visiting today, just uh, lift your hand up as our ushers walk back. Just hold your hand up as they walk by the pew where you're at. That's right. Just hold your hand up. Just hold your hand up. They'll give you a visitor's packet. Inside that packet, there's information about the church and then there's a visitor's card we'd ask you to fill it out. A few moments we'll receive an offer and drop that card into the offering plate. Let me read a thank you card to the church. And thank you all for your kind words <clears throat> and all the beautiful cards. Noah really enjoyed them. Thank you all for taking the time to give Noah something so special. And thank you all for having such a caring heart. Thank you all for the beautiful Christmas cards and Christmas blessings. And that's from Noah. That's a young man that loves to get Christmas cards. And our church sent him Christmas cards. Little things can be a blessing. Amen. Little things can be a blessing. And let me remind you on February the 14th, it's Big Heart Sunday. Don't break the heart of Jesus. Be in church. Try to bring everybody you can to church with you that Sunday. We have a lot more to give you before Big Heart Sunday. And um, then Wednesday night. Don't forget Wednesday night's Bible study on Exodus chapter number 14. Last Wednesday night. Let me, I'd encourage you to get real familiar with Exodus 14, there's a lot of help how to make it through troublesome times in that chapter. And we didn't get through the first truth, so we'll go back and finish it Wednesday night. And then on March the 14th and 15th, Dr. Ralph Sexton will be with us on those two nights. And then hopefully that uh, we'll go all week, but he's made, uh, he's made room for two nights there, the 14th and 15th. So... Be much in prayer for those times. Now, all the young people today that, uh, you know, you didn't ride the van or anything, uh, see uh, Rob after the service right there, and they're all going to Golden Corral for lunch. Golden Corral for lunch. Amen. That's the reason I've got to... Okay, all right. All that didn't ride the bus, go to. All right? All right. So uh, that's the reason I've got extra inches around my... I go to the Golden Corral too often. Eat too much fried chicken. Amen. If our men come, we receive the morning giving you give as the Lord has blessed and prospered you.
Let's ask the blessing this morning on the giving. Let's stand. Would you pray for us? Amen. Amen. you to take your Bibles this morning, turn with us to the book of Acts chapter number 24. Acts chapter 24. Our scripture reading will be verse 24 through 27. And I pray that you shall give great attention to the message today. I hope that you will listen real careful to the title of the message the danger of delay, the danger of delay. Follow with me as I read in your hearing, beginning with verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Dursila, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Get that. He heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he, <clears throat> that's the Apostle Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, a change of mind, literally repentance, and judgment to come, meaning what's going to happen if you do not trust and have faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then one day judgment to come. Notice what happened. Felix trembled, mighty conviction, mighty disturbance in his soul, and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And as far as we know, that convenient season never came. As far as we know, and we can read in church history and read in secular history that the governor of Judah, Felix, delayed too late. Shall we pray? Father, there might be some of us that sit in this place today that is dull of hearing. There's some of us sit here today and we've already procrastinated many times. There's many of us today that probably is sitting in the hopes of tomorrow what we're going to do. But help us to realize this morning we have no promise of seeing the sun set this afternoon. And Father, as you speak to our hearts in this place right now, help us to be not like Felix, to say a more convenient day, I'll do something about what I've heard. 
I pray today, Lord, that we'll all become judgment day honest with God and with ourselves. And we will not keep procrastinating. We will not keep putting off to tomorrow what we know that we ought to do right now. Speak to our hearts in a most powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, in body, I do not even feel like being here. This morning, if my mind doesn't function clearly to say everything I want it to say, but I do pray that God will take intervention today. And I do pray if this be my life's message, it would be a message that you would never forget. Because I believe it's one of the most powerful messages in my own life that God has ever spoken to me about the urgency of the air. And I'm convinced today that most people know what they ought to be doing, but most people are hoping for a more convenient season, a better day. I think Felix had a missed opportunity. He had an opportunity to get right with God. He had an opportunity to be saved. He had an opportunity to die and go to heaven. But I think he missed that opportunity. I think if you'll read on down in chapter 26, there's another man by the name of King Agrippa. As Paul gave him his testimony, King Agrippa said, Thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost, but yet lost. Almost, but yet lost. I think of the pagan philosophers in Acts chapter 17 as Paul preached to them and gave them the word of God. In verse 32 of Acts 17 says, We shall hear you again concerning this. And they had a missed opportunity. In Luke chapter 9 verse 57 through 62 that I read to you last Sunday morning on following the Lord Jesus Christ. One came and said, Lord, I will follow you. And the Lord looked at him and said, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. And then they started to make an excuses why they did not want to follow the Lord. Missed opportunity. I think of the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins in Matthew chapter 25. And what a missed opportunity. But the man in the Bible that had the most missed opportunity, I believe, was Judas. Judas knew that he had never truly believed on Jesus as the Messiah. Judas knew down in his heart he was an unbeliever and he had not really embraced faith in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe every time that Judas saw the Lord minister, and every time that Judas saw the Lord perform a miracle or do something, I believe with all of my heart, Judas wanted to step out and say, Lord, I'm right now embracing you as my Lord and my Savior. I've been a pretender and I, I'm a hypocrite. I'm not really in uh, as a disciple. And, and, and all of those times, Judas had to miss opportunity until John chapter 13 and then Satan took cold, complete control of his life. And I do not believe Judas ever had another opportunity. There was a man that lay dying one day. And he was in great distress of his soul. His pastor was standing there consoling him in the moment of his passing. And finally the man looked up at the pastor and said, Pastor, I'm a saved man. And just in a few minutes, I'm going to stand in the presence of my Lord. But he said, Pastor, what am I going to say to my Lord and Master about a wasted Christian life? What am I going to say to my Lord about a wasted Christian life? I had time to watch the ball game. I had time to watch Fox News. I had time to go dine. I had time to do many things. But I never had time and never made time to spend time with the Word of God and spend time in the ministry that God called me to do. A wasted life. 
Could there be this morning many people who are living in a state of delay? Tomorrow I'll pray. Tomorrow I'll read my Bible. Tomorrow I'll study. Tomorrow I'll give my tithes and offerings. Tomorrow I'll witness and tell someone about the Lord Jesus Christ. Next Sunday I'll bring someone to church with me. Can I tell you there's a mastermind behind that philosophy of life? It's Satan himself. The road to failure is paved with delay. The road to failure is paved with delay. The only thing for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. The only thing for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And what are we doing in our churches in America today? We are a bunch and don't get mad and don't hate me for what I'm getting to say. We're satisfied of doing nothing. We're satisfied. We're satisfied of being people today that's not involved of changing the world around about us. We know we should get woke up. We know that we should do these things, but we live in the danger of delay. Tomorrow, I'll do it. Tomorrow, I'll do it. I read about a man that was feeling bad, a man that was sick in body, and he finally went to his doctor. He went to his doctor, and his doctor examined him. He brought him in, and he sat him down, and he said, uh, I believe we need to put you and meet you to the hospital, and I believe we need to do some tests and take some biopsies. The man looked at his doctor and says, Doctor, tomorrow morning my wife and I, we've got plans to go to Florida for six months. And we're going to leave tomorrow. And when I come back, I'll have the test then. The man went to Florida, spent his six months. He had a lot of difficulty during that time. He came back. He went to the doctor. Doctor put him into the hospital, did the biopsies did the test, and he walked into his room, and he said, you've only got a few weeks to live. But the good news was, if we would have had you here six months ago, we probably could have ministered a cure for your body. But simply because of delay, you've only got a few days to live. The danger of delay the danger. Hey, listen, I, I, I go every six months, I get scanned from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet because I've had cancer kicking out of my neck, my face, and the bad kind. And I go every six months. I'd be foolish not to go and have a checkup because knowing the danger of the cancer that could come back on my body in a short period of time even take my life. I think of Lot lingered down in Sodom. Lot delayed. And the longer he stayed in Sodom, the harder it was for him to leave. And the longer that he lingered in Sodom, the fewer people knew that he was a real believer. I read a fable, went something like this quite a few years ago. The devil had a council and he brought all of his cohorts and his demons in. And he said, now I want you to tell me how we condemn more souls in hell, lost without God. Tell me how that we can hurt the mind of God and the heart of God with more souls dying lost. One demon stepped up and said, I tell you what us do. Us tell them there is no God. The devil looked and said, I don't believe that'll work. They can see creation in too much. Another demon stepped up and said, I tell you what us do. Us tell them the Bible is not true. He said, that won't work. Another stepped up and us said, us tell them there's no heaven and there's no hell. 
And they kept going, and finally there was one little demon stepped up and said, I tell you what, let's do. Devil, let's tell them there is a God. Let's tell them the Bible is true. Let's tell them there is salvation. Let's tell them there is a heaven. Let's tell them there is a hell. But let's get them to put it off until tomorrow. And one day they'll die lost without God. The danger of delay. The danger of delay to the lost person. The danger of delay to someone that sits under the sound of my voice that's not saved. The danger of someone that's an unbeliever. The danger. Danger number one is the danger of hardening your heart. Every time you get an opportunity and God speaks to your heart and you say no, you're hardening the heart. 80% of all people today that are believers or are Christians got saved before they was 21 years of age. There's very few people get saved after they're 50 or 60 years of age. You get to your 60s and 70s, it's very seldom that anybody is ever saved at that old of age. When you're young, your heart is tender. When you're young, your heart is receptive as a child. Even the Lord said, you must come as a child with that simple childlike faith. But the longer you resist and the longer you say no, the danger of hardening your heart. You're playing Russian roulette with your soul. See, the danger of getting used to it, the danger of getting used to the dark, the danger of living without God. 1968, Pat and I bought a mobile home, moved it out on the Irwin Highway. First night we were there, about 1 o'clock in the morning, there was a train. We did not realize that we lived within 20 foot of the railroad track. And about 1 o'clock in the morning, that train come through there and it pulled that horn and it blowed. And both of us jumped out of the bed and, and thought the world had come to an end. But six months later, it didn't bother us. There was a day that things bothered us. There was th days that when things disturbed us, but it does no more because we've hardened our heart against the things of God. See, literally, if your grandparents was to come to your house and walk into your living room... And watch what you watch on the TV. Your grandpa would go get the double barrel shotgun and shoot it. But we've got used to it. It don't bother us anymore. There's the danger of hardening the heart. Secondly, there's the danger of losing your soul. Mark chapter 8 and verse 36 said, If you gained the whole world and lost your own soul, what would it profit you? If you had all the world and everybody bow down to you as master and Lord of their life and you die lost without Jesus Christ, it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal. I read about a wealthy man. He invested great wealth in this diamond. And this goes back many years ago. And he was taking a boat trip to Europe. And he was standing on this gigantic ship. Like the Queen Elizabeth and all that sailed the Atlantic before planes came. And he invested a great deal of wealth in this diamond and he was holding it on the ship and the fellow knew how much he, he said 
I don't believe I'd be holding that loosely, knowing how much you invested in that. He said, ah, don't worry. Nothing ain't going to happen. And about that time, a, a wave hit, and the ship went like that, and it came out of his hand, and he watched it roll down and fall into the ocean. We say, what a fool. Well, let me tell you the biggest fool is the fool that gambles with another chance for your soul. Playing Russian roulette with your soul. Danger number three to the lost person. And folks, listen. There is a danger of dying and going to hell. I know, I know that's a word that we don't like to think about. I know it's a word that our politicians like to stand up and use often and don't even have an understanding, a comprehension that there is a literal hell. There's the danger of dying and going to hell. People say, well, I got plenty of time. I got plenty of time. I got plenty of time. Boast not thyself of tomorrow because thou knowest what a day may bring forth. I got plenty of time. How many people have I had their funeral and the last words, not today, preacher, not today, preacher. How many people in this 45 years have I saw raise their hand in churches and say I'm lost and need to be saved and walk out the door unsaved? There is the danger of dying and going to hell. How many of you believe it's a fool that plays Russian roulette? How many of you know what that is? It's taking a pistol that's got a cylinder and you put one bullet in there, you spin it, and pull the hammer back and say, but it could be. Who knows today who will be alive tomorrow? The danger of dying and going to hell. Hey, hey listen. If you, if you believe what I'm getting ready to say to you. If you really believe what I'm getting ready to say to you. And I'm going to say to you right now, there is a bomb in this church. Now, I know you don't believe me. But if you believe me, there's a bomb in this church. And it's set to go off to blow this building and all of us to smithereens. If you believe what I was saying to you, and I said it could be set to go off in the next five minutes, it could be set to go off in the next five hours. It could be set to go off in the next five days or five weeks or five months. If you really believed it, how many of you are going to sit here? If you really believed it, there's not one of you. If you really believe there is a hell that this Bible describes, you will not delay. You will not argue with the Holy Spirit. You will not argue with the convicting power of God that speaks to your heart. You will do something about it right now. There's another danger. There's the danger of missing the rapture. The Bible talks about the Lord coming back after his church. If you've heard the word of God and if you've heard the gospel and you've heard the message of God and you've rejected according to the book of 2 Thessalonians, you will be damned and believe the lie. And then there's the danger of sudden death. I think of Lee Eldenburg. When I went to Gunnings Baptist Church, Miss Eldenburg, oh, she was one of these saints of God, praying, God-fearing, godly, saint of God. And she'd prayed and prayed and prayed for Lee to be saved. And I went to see Lee and got him to church a few times and kept witnessing to Lee and Kept talking to Lee and kept praying for Lee. And Lee was a truck driver. And 
Every once in a while, he'd show up at church, but he'd always say, and I'd go visit him, no, preacher, not today, some other day. November the 23rd, 1997, Lee Ellenberg got saved and followed the Lord in believer's baptism. But on February the 15th, 1998, Lee Ellenberg died. He cut it pretty short, didn't he? Just a few days, and he'd have died lost. There's the danger of sudden death. There's not a one of you can tell me when you're going to die. But how many of you know this? We're all terminal. We're all headed for that appointment. There's the danger. There's a danger this morning for the church. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, and I got on a study this week about the most misused verses in the Bible, the, the many most quoted verses in the Bible. Second Chronicles 7, 14, if you take it in its context, is to Solomon and to the nation of Israel and to the temple. But praise God, there's a principle there for you and I today that we can lay a hold of too. Hey, God changes in different dispensations, but the principles of God never changes. And 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is a principle still you and I can lay a hold of. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Hey, folks, God said if we would humble ourselves, if we would get broken and pray and seek his face and repent, we can have revival. But God won't send revival to a bunch of people that is not willing to do what he calls you to do right now. Oh, preacher, it's not urgent. If there was ever a day the church had revival, it ought to be today. The danger of the church keeps saying tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll pray. Tomorrow I'll get in Bible study. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll pray for my family. Tomorrow I'll tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day what happens? Tomorrow doesn't come. What do we need to do this morning, church? We need to surrender it all right now. I'm going to have a meeting with God right now. I ain't going to put it off any longer. I'm going to walk out of here with a prayer life. I'm going to walk out of here as a student and a person that's going to know this book. I'm going to walk out of here this morning with a determination to witness to people and tell them about the same. How many of you believe Jesus is too good to keep in these four walls? My tithes and offerings will be in. I'm going to be filled with the Spirit of God and live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be led in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. I'm going to ask God to give me an awakening. How many of you know this morning this pastor has an awesome responsibility to do everything he can to wake us up? But if you don't want to be woken up, I can't do one thing about it and God can't do one thing about it. But I pray today that you will not put off delaying to do what God's speaking to you to do right now. We talked about the blessings. There's no greater thing than know the Lord live in God's will for his life. I got in a discussion. I, I, I tell you, I, I, I mentioned it's hard to talk to this world today because they do not even rationally think anymore. I was in discussion about losing your salvation. And I said, how in the world are you going to undo a birth? And this is what this person looked at me and said, 
I didn't have a choice in my first birth, but I had a choice in my last birth. And if I had a choice to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, I've got a choice to deny him and reject him. And this is what I looked across the table. I said, are you in your right mind? Yeah, I'm in my right mind. I said, anybody in the right mind would tell me they're rejecting heaven and going to hell? We got a crazy world today. You know, I engaged with an atheist. And you know, I said, well, you're religion of atheists. Oh, no, no, that's not a religion. They don't want to deny their religion, but they want to deny my faith. And they want to have a religion without God to escape conviction. If they can get rid of God, they can get rid of guilt. But it amazes me when you start talking to them about God and scriptures, how upset they get. If they ain't no God, why are you so upset? This one said, now preacher, I'm an atheist. I said, just suppose the Bible's the word of God. Just suppose there's a heaven. And just suppose Jesus is the Son of God. And I never seen a man get so upset and so cantankerous and out of spirit in my life. If they ain't no God, why are you so mad? I tell you why. Just like drugs and alcohol, it's an escape mechanism to try to get away from the truth. There is a God. Please don't delay like Felix. Missed opportunity. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. How many people in 45 years have I saw miss the opportunity as God spoke to their heart to say no? I can go back in my mind and I can see people that I witnessed to, I shared the word of God with them, and they were deeply under conviction, but they said no. And then time after time after time, I've tried to talk to them people again, and they never again had any concern about coming to Christ and being saved. I beg you this morning, don't play Russian roulette. I beg you this morning, don't put off one more moment if God's speaking to your heart. Don't say a more convenient season, Lord. Today's the day of salvation right now. Right now. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed as we stand to our feet. Judgment day honest. And they can raise your hand and say today, Pastor Yeldon, I'm a saved person. I know today in whom I believe. I know in whom I have committed my life to. How many can raise your hand and say, I know it? God bless you. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful to know that everything's all right? 
Isn't it wonderful to know today that you know the Savior. He's personal to you. You'd say, Pastor Yeldon, I've got to become judgment day honest with God and myself. Don't be like a Judas and have a missed opportunity again. If God's speaking in your heart right now and you say, Pastor, I couldn't raise my hand a while ago. But right now, God's speaking in my heart. I want you to pray for me. One anywhere as I wait just a moment. As I wait just a moment as I look over this auditorium, as I look, as I wait. As I look as I wait. I see no hands raised. I mean, would have to be honest. As I told you about the man that lay dying. And his pastor was standing there consoling him. And he said, Pastor, I'm saved. I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but I'm getting ready to stand in his presence. What am I going to tell him about a wasted life? What are we going to tell him because we don't have time to pray anymore? We don't have time to minister. We don't have time to love people. We don't have time to go to our families and our friends and our neighbors and tell them about the greatest news there is, the news of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many of you say, I'm saved, but pastor... I need to stop procrastinating. I need to start doing what God's called me to do. Pray for me, Pastor. Amen. Raise that hand and say, pray for me. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise His holy name. You're going to stand and pick your nose and pick your fingers and look at the wall and look at the ceiling. But what you need to do let the Holy Spirit and God Almighty really deal with your soul and honest and your spirit and honest and eternal revelation. Judgment day honest. Is there something you need to do this morning this invitation? Maybe this is the place that God blesses you and the place your membership ought to be and if it is, This morning, obey the Lord and that church membership. If you need to make a public profession of faith, do it. If you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, do it. Whatever God's speaking to your heart about doing this morning, do it. Father, I pray in the next few moments in this invitation that there won't be no Felixes. They'll say a, a better time, a better day. God, help them realize and help me and all of us realize we've never had a better time, better opportunity than right now. And God, help us to do what you speak to us about doing. If there's someone that's not saved, I pray this morning, God, they'll step out, come down this aisle and say, I need the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Mm. God, I have for someone that's like a Judas and they know that they don't have peace with God. Help them to settle it this morning, God. Lord, whatever, God, the need is, I pray in mercy, God, that you'll keep calling and keep dealing in that heart, in that life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.